Hello and welcome back to Aphros Base 9.31 Stitched. We are back. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, last time on Aphros Base. You said that like you just got teleported into the room and you're confused. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Where am I? I had in a cue card. <laughs> Go ahead, start speaking. Uh, last time on Aetheral Space, Skipper defeated the Hierophant, and um, Ruth and Serena had made their way down Ruth to where Helga was. Sorry, Ruth and Mila. Wait, so Bruno and Serena were you're gone? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Ruth and Mila made their way down to um, uh, Helga and started fighting Helga. And Mila was like, babe, come back. And Helga was like, no, babe, I can't. Plus, you're selfish. Plus L, plus ratio. And then Mila was like, that's really cringe. And then Helga was like, she might be right about that. And I think that was it. But then Ruth went to uh, Rufo mode. And roofed all over everyone. Oh, yeah. She Aether burned a little. And then she, like, uh, did a revolution there set on herself. And was like, she's like, I'm going Rufo mode. I forgot about that. It's been a week, okay? Okay. I'm doing my best. Here. This guy killed the right, that... I, I did. <laughs> it's pretty brutal. Sorry again to everyone who watches um, this, this next week's podcast. Imagine but the we're... section of the audience that watches April Space and not discovering SCP and trying to address this half a person. <laughs> <laughs> alright, 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 alright. <clears throat> my new Apex Bishop. I must thank you for the war for my warmest of receptions. I must admit that, given the humanists' previous lack of interest in my expertise, I did not imagine much of the facilities that would be available to me. More fool me! It has surpassed my wildest imaginings. As such, I imagine the birthday present we discussed for your noble personage will be completed in due t in sorry in good time. Your negative numbers were splendid, indeed. But I assure you that Xeroth will be an even greater masterpiece. This is this like Zanzanic Beta? <laughs> Archive communication from script cloud 18. Kick dodged. Punch blocked. Leg sweep jumped. Palm thrust grabbed. Throat jab bitten. A scream of pain silenced with a headbutt. Yeah, it's gamer time. The air pressure created by such sudden and strong movements sent Mila Green flying down to the floor, her back slamming against the brick wall behind her. She had to squint to perceive the battle going on right before her. A thunderstorm of red aether was raging through the room, creating spots in her vision from the sheer brightness of the spectacle. So it does actually produce light that's interesting. Yeah. Ruth and Helga were barely visible, two incoherent blurs locked in combat. The positions of attacker and defender seemed to switch second by second between the two. And slowly but surely, Ruth was overpowering Helga. Every attack Helga sent at her was blocked, and every attack Ruth unleashed met its mark. The result of the battle was already obvious. The moment Ruth had been hit by that streak of light, the sheer difference in power between her and Helga had become starkly apparent. From what Mila could see, Helga's techniques were specialized for quick assassination, ending the battle as quickly as possible. Against an opponent like this powered-up Ruth, who could keep up with whatever Helga threw out, she was at a significant disadvantage. She was getting exhausted quickly, whereas Ruth was still going full force. Mila put a hand to her forehead, keeping her hair out of her eyes, and then she saw it. The climactic moment. The moment Helga made the final mistake afforded to her. She thrust her fingers to forward at Ruth's eyes, clearly intending to poke them out, and Ruth saw the attack coming from a mile away. With aether-infused speed, she lunged to the side, avoiding the blow and leaving Helga entirely open. Helga stared uncomprehendingly at the empty air that, from her point of view, had suddenly replaced Ruth. Then she blinked. Oh, she said. The kick struck her in the head, far too fast for her to see it coming and defend. She went down like a pile of bricks, her body limp, traces of aether fading from the tips of her fingers. A low, involuntary groan trickled from her throat before trailing off entirely. Mila picked herself up. I is she dead? She asked quietly, looking down at Helga. The aether surrounding Ruth began to clear up, and as she stepped forward, she shook her head. The manic look had left her eyes, and the fatigue of the fight seemed to have finally registered in her slumped posture. Uh, sorry, I lost my place for a second. Not unless she's weak as shit. I held back with that last kick, she explained, wiping some of the blood from her mouth. I haven't got any Neverwire, so we'll have to find a way to keep her restrained. Help me... 
help me carry her out of here, would you? Mila meekly nodded. Ruth's body was racked with pain. Ruth's body was exhausted. Ruth's body, truth be told, was probably going to drop into unconsciousness sooner rather than later. And yet her mind was racing. The power she just tapped into was intoxicating. Strength born of pushing herself beyond her limits, of burning herself with her own aether without the pain and damage that would usually accompany it. The wear and tear that would usually accompany an aether burn was diverted to a recorded revolutionaire set instead, allowing her to keep moving. She could feel that set of armor, floating at the back of her mind, damaged yet recovering. How long would it take to fully recover? Two minutes? Three? Was there a way for her to speed up that process? If she could, did that mean she'd be able to keep using that kind of power continuously? That seems very overpowered. How would no one have thought of that before? It's a, it's a weird technique. <laughs> I suppose so. Her mind did, but like the idea of just storing aether in a container and then sh putting it on yourself to artificially burn. Maybe since no one's ever thought. Isn't... I suppose so. Her mind danced through the possibilities. If that's the case, though, then the fifth dead stupid as fuck for doing a normal aether burn and not having a battery ready for that. Her mind danced through the possibilities, excitement shaking Ruth's body just as much as the injuries. As she and Mila got Helga out of the restaurant as quickly as possible, getting her into the stolen vehicle they'd brought here, Ruth's eyes were on nothing but the future. The future and the strength she'd meet it with. Ah, uh, fuck, I forgot her voice. It was, like, slightly old, but not quite. Yeah. It was like someone trying to sound older than she actually is. <laughs> yeah. Wake up, sleepyhead, purred Gertrude Hearth. Hearth. Oh, wait, sorry, I can do that better. Wake up, sleepyhead, purred Gertrude Hearth. The words cut through the last remnants of Muzazi's unconsciousness. He opened his eyes. The room he, he was in was more than dark. It was pitch black, the only things visible being vague shapes. The lump standing a short distance away from him had to be Gertrude, but he could only tell that from the fact he'd heard her voice. Then, of course, there was the thing he was strapped into. Some kind of chair, made of something solid and sturdy, his hands firmly bound to its arms. Cables ran out from the sides of the arms, too, terminating in transparent suction cups firmly connected to Muzazi's own limbs. He wasn't sure exactly what this contraption was, but it didn't take a genius to work out the situation would end in torture. He reached for his aether, and found it absent. Gertrude's ability was in effect, without a doubt. I like to collect these things, Gertrude said mildly. And as she did, the faintest white light switched on from the arm of the chair. It illuminated her face just barely, enough to confirm her identity. But her features were warped and softened by the darkness. I, am, I know exactly what you're talking about. Like, when it's like, you only see, like, the cheekbones, yeah. kind of, and, like, the eyes. Yeah... It was like she was an impression of a human being, an optical illusion looking at and speaking to him. This antique was found on a junk planet by some of our scavengers. Can you imagine? A piece of history like this, just lying in the trash. Do you know what this is? Muzazi did not answer. He understood how these situations worked. If he gave Gertrude any of his words, more and more would be pulled out until she had what she needed or she was satisfied with the pain she dealt him. If Gertrude took offense at a silence, she didn't show it. It's an artifact from the supremacy, she said softly, her eyes slowly running over the device. I don't know if it has a special name, per se, but it belonged to Henry the Glutton, the previous Supreme. According to history, he'd have his enemies tenderized with this before devouring them and their aether. Charming character, really. Don't you agree? Does that imply you can eat someone's aether if they don't summon it, or did he, like, force them to summon it? That was, like, his ability. Oh, so it is plausible. So aether is something that's kind of, like, also dormant within you. It's something you channel through yourself, yeah. But, like, even if you're not channeling it, it can be taken, right? Through various means. Because I'm You'd wondering, like, you use it, basically, first. Oh, okay, never mind. Because I was going to say, like, e remember Eli, he couldn't use Aether, but he technically had a core. It just was, like, incompatible with his personality. Yeah. I was wondering if there was a way you could have forced the Aether out of him. That's interesting. A chill ran down Muzazi's spine. As a citizen of the Supremacy, he'd naturally learned about Henry the Glutton's reign. When? And that sort of thing certainly seemed in character for the lunatic. By all accounts, he, is, he had been among the most unworthy of Supremes. Still... 
He did not move. <coughs> Ordinarily with your skills, Gertrude said, fishing a remote out of her pocket, I'd want you trained as one of my negative numbers. Only, they're being phased out right now. Lucky you. Instead, I'll just have you tell me what Giovanni is planning. I'm sure someone of your strength is part of that inner circle. Still, he did not move. Shall we begin? Gertrude smiled. Feel free to confess any time. She tapped the remote with her index finger, and the device whirred into life. The light on the arm changed color, a frigid blue, accompanied by a chill that poured through Uzazi's insides. It felt like someone had poured freezing water into his veins, and it was all he could do to keep his teeth from shattering. This is the worst thing you could have written. It's so cold out right now. <laughs> That's because Still, you're in the chair. I'm going to I eat am. your ether. <laughs> and after the warm-up, Gertrude said, sliding her finger across the remote again. The main event. The light switched to red. An excruciating pain erupted throughout Muzazi's body. It was as if his skin had been doused with acid, his flesh poured into a grinder, his bones tossed into an inferno. <clears throat> to call such a sensation torture would be to make torture seem overly cruel. Still, still, he did not move. Atoy Muzazi did not cry out. He did not change his expression. He did not even blink. He simply continued to stare at Gertrude Hearth, his eyes boring their way into her soul. At first, she continued to look back at him, that smug smile on her lips. But then, as long seconds passed without any response, it faded. Finally, she glanced away, and Muzazi knew that he had won. Whatever, she sighed, turning away and strolling off into the darkness. We'll see how you feel in the morning. Pardon me if I forget to turn it off. Her voice faded, too, and a second later, Muzazi heard the heavy clunk of a door. She'd left the room and gone elsewhere. Only then did a toy Muzazi permit himself to scream. Olga Malwarian kept to the shadows, Patriota pulling her through the quiet spaces of the world. The humilist headquarters, right in the center of the menagerie, was like a maze. Countless ships and buildings had been bound and merged together to form a chaotic jumble of architectural styles and functions. Olga didn't doubt that people could get lost in this place, but fortunately she'd memorized the maps that Joan had given her. That had been her mission, after all. She moved across the ceiling, Patriota splitting into several sections and dragging her along like fabric tentacles. The scarf was an Aether armament, responding to her thoughts directly and automatically protecting her. It had been a gift to her from Joan, the only, things that allowed her, the only thing that allowed her to fight as a shadow warrior of the Supremacy. Patriota's arms were supple and strong, and so they were easily capable of forcing a vent cover free from the ceiling and granting her entry. She'd always been small, and so it was no trouble for her to climb into the vents. Sus. Darkness claimed... What? Hmm? Oh, she's sus? Are you saying she's, she's the think. imposter? <laughs> yeah, she could be engineer. Maybe you should think about that before you make Sorry. guesses claims. Okay? I don't play Among Us. <laughs> I only read the novels. I, I... <laughs> the manga for Among Us? <laughs> Darkness claimed her as she slipped through the veins of the complex, slowly but surely making her way towards her objective. Joan had trusted her with this, but Olga had known from the start. Is it Joan or Jean. Joan? Joan Lyons. Jean. Jean had trusted her with this, but Olga had known from the start that a toy Muzazi didn't have what it took for this work. Any fool could hold a sword and declare themselves a warrior, but a real warrior was one able to do the dirty business. A real warrior was able to toss aside any notions of honor or decency and slip a knife into the back that was required of them. That was what it took to protect a nation. Knives in the dark. Oh my god, I'm hearing some real SCP ball just ass rhetoric <laughs> here right now. Olga paused in the vents as two masked gardeners my walked down the hall. Olga, below. Fred. <laughs> I, I'm gonna guess these two masked gardeners are Dragon and Bruno slash Serena talking quietly between themselves. This was one of the less busy parts of the building, free of the hustle and bustle that plagued the lower floors. Even as she'd hid, Olga hadn't seen anyone else in a while. That wasn't what caught her attention, though. What caught her attention was what they were saying. Are you sure this is the right way? One of them was muttering, voice gruff. The other nodded. She'll want to keep Muzazi close to her, so she can use her ability if he tries anything. Apparently, she hangs out in the garden most of the time. We'll start our search out from there. Sounds like a risk. This whole thing's a risk. 
Might as well make it one that pays off. Olga frowned behind her scarf. These two, clearly they weren't actual gardeners, seemed to be looking for the same quarry as her. Other GID operatives? No. Jeanne would have told her about them. Someone else wanted the swordsman then. This wasn't something she could leave alone. As the two gardeners stepped into a nearby elevator, Olga slithered in behind them, hugging as close to the ceiling as she could, as Patriota kept her attached in the darkness. If these two just looked up, they could have seen her, but she was not concerned about that. Olga emptied her presence. It was a technique Jean had taught her, a way to become utterly unseen to the world. He said that he taught many people this skill, but she was the only one to master it so quickly. She had a talent for it, he'd said. She had talent for so few things, so he hearing that had made her truly happy. She became scenery, as nondescript as a coffee cup or a poster on the wall. Positioned above and behind the two gardeners, she watched as the doors of the elevator slid shut. Slowly, she unfurled Patriota's arms, lowering herself, getting ready to lash out and strike, and, and she received a punch in the back of the head! It took her a second to understand what had happened. One of the gardeners had suddenly vanished in a spark of blue aether, before suddenly appearing behind her and attacking. He was holding her arm behind her back with great force, when knee already planted against the base of her spine as they fell to the ground. Her face smacked into the cold floor of the elevator, and she felt the movement of the capsule through her cheek. She went to writhe out of her assailant's grip, but no good. Not even Patriota was able to move for some reason. Neverwire? Don't beat up little girls, Mr. Dragon! the gruff gardener said in horror, only they weren't so gruff anymore. Their voice had completely changed, becoming high-pitched and unrecognizable. The person restraining her sighed. Don't tell them my name, Mr. Dragon said. Don't you have experience with this kind of thing? Besides, she was getting ready to attack us. I saw her sneaking into the elevator. Gruff spoke up once more, and when he did, he was gruff again. She's not with the humanists. She was already sneaking around before she spotted us. What? Dragon said, sounding incredulous. You already knew she was there? Yeah, I saw her. Wanted to get more information before I acted. She was about to attack us! I would have intervened. <laughs> I would intervene. Before squatting down next to her. Yeah. Come on, your god. <clears throat> this is hurting my throat. Yeah, you sound a lot more like Mike than normal. <laughs> yeah, how do I... What's it normally Come sound on, like? Can you give me the... <laughs> Are you in heaven? <laughs> you? What's it normally like? God. It was just yeah. sort of like How this. about we have a talk kid? It's a little what less are you doing here? Now, how about we have a talk kid? What are you doing here? Like that? Uh, yeah. She stayed silent. Jean had given her practical training on how to resist interrogation. She'd made him proud with the results there. Don't be mean, uh, b Gruff said in his high-pitched voice. Look at her. She's too cute. I don't think anyone needs to get hurt here. Again, Dragon sighed. It seemed a practiced sound. Telling someone you're not going to hurt them before the interrogation kind of defeats the purpose of the interrogation. At least let her worry about it. Huh? Girl Gruff cocked her head. But it's obvious she's here for Muzazi too, right? Olga's heart skipped a beat, but she did her best not to let it show on her face. Something must have betrayed her, though, as she felt the hand on her arm tighten just slightly. How do you figure? Dragon asked quietly. She's sneaking through this area to get to the garden, right? We're sneaking through this area to get to the garden, too. The only reason she'd be going the exact same way we are is if she was doing the exact same thing we are. It doesn't take a genius, Mr. Dragon. It's true. All rooms only have one purpose. <laughs> That's actually how they're designed. Exactly. Dragon tightened his grip on her arm again. Is she right? He asked her. Olga said nothing. If she is right, then I have a proposal for you, Dragon continued, his voice low. Our objective is to break a toy Musasi free. If yours is the same, then that's just fantastic. Rather than fighting each other like a bunch of idiots, we can just work together to do it. The more the merrier, right? Olga intended to keep silent, but... Everything in the... Sorry, I forgot his voice. Fuck. It was kind of like just calm like this. <coughs> uh. Everything in this world exists primarily as a resource, Jean had told her. The thing to do in all cases is figure out how to exploit it, even if your legs are broken or your arms are torn off. So long as you're alive, there exists a way to use those facts to your advantage. But what about enemies? Olga had asked, still naive. Enemies are obstacles! Jean had smiled just a little bit at that. 
Oh, Olga, he'd said. Obstacles are the greatest resources of all. He'd taught her how to spot these chances. She'd learned well. He'd always praised her for that. Slowly, from her position on the floor, Olga nodded her head. Don't forget, Dragon said quietly, standing behind his new partner in crime. I can disable your Aether with my ability at any time. Don't give me a reason to. That was a lie, of course. Dragon had just used the finger he'd taken from Aiden, Aiden Blaith. It was bound with Neverwire, and so he'd pressed it up against the girl's scarf to keep it in contact. If she got any kind of distance at all from him, he wouldn't be able to keep using it. But it was best that she didn't know that. The girl just nodded again. She still hadn't said a word to them. Was she mute, or just... Wasn't it a fingernail he got from Aiden? No, it was a finger. Okay. It was held his uh, seventh finger. Oh, jeez. Or just not wanting to let anything slip. I like your scarf, said Serena, looking the girl up and down. It's cute! The girl just pulled the scarf further up her face and shrugged. They made an unusual-looking trio. Two anonymous figures in stolen gardening uniforms and a girl with a black raincoat and a red scarf. They'd have a hard time explaining her presence if they ran into anyone else. You have a name? Dragon asked, tapping his foot against the elevator floor, the comforting vibration confirming they were still going up. It's going to get old calling you kid all the time. The girl mumbled something, made nearly inaudible by sheer quietness in the fabric over her mouth. Sorry? Dragon asked. Warm cat, the girl mumbled. She sounded almost embarrassed to say it, and Dragon couldn't really blame her. It was a lame-sounding code name after all. Well, uh, warm cat, Dragon said, we'll watch each other's backs. You're with the same guys as a Muzazi, right? Once we bust him out, he can go back with you. We just need to avoid getting caught. Easier said than done. The elevator stopped with a ding, indicating that they'd finally reached Gertrude's garden. Dragon cracked his neck, stepped forward, and stopped. His hand was inches away from the button to open the door, hovering there, but he couldn't bring himself to push it. Something was wrong. There was something terrible beyond that door. His body knew that instinctively. My god, he got fucking video games. <laughs> fucking <sense>. pressure. <laughs> Dragon, Bruno said cautiously. Take us back down. Now. Dragon nodded, tapping the down button. At first, there was no response, but a moment later, a, th a synthesized voice spoke. Command rejected. Reason, elevator disabled. Bruno took in a deep breath. Seems we haven't got a choice, then. I'll keep you two covered with my shields. Before Dragon could protest any further, Bruno slapped the door button with his palm, and they slid open in response. Darkness lay on the other side, but Bruno stepped through without hesitation. Dragon could see the faint shapes of trees and plants and the illumination available from the elevator, but it seemed that the lights in the garden proper had been turned off. Warmcat tested the outside of the elevator with her scarf, and when no attack came, she followed Bruno out. It seemed they had no choice. Dragon sighed and stepped out. You seem to think we're a bunch of idiots, don't you? A woman's voice, Gertrude Harth's voice, echoed throughout the garden. From the sound of it, it was coming from some kind of speaker that we're incapable of reacting to any of your little schemes. Young Giovanni really must find better help. Dragon frowned. Giovanni? Did she think they were with the Superbians, then? I'm sorry? He called out, maintaining the facade of the gardener. Ma'am, I don't know what you're talking about. It's my shift. Why are the lights off, and who's this girl? I don't understand. There was derision in Gertrude's voice. Honestly... Did you think we had no way of keeping track of those allowed to enter this area? Keeping tabs on the gardener's positions was Negative One's job. It was easy for him to tell when they were knocked unconscious. Say hello, won't you, Negative One? A single light clicked on, illuminating the center of the clearing, revealing one of the black-bandaged figures standing a few meters away. He was completely still, covered in frant icing fabric, head from head to toe. No. No, he wasn't standing. He was kneeling, kneeling in a puddle of his own blood. There were corpses everywhere, fallen on the ground, slumped beneath trees, corpses wrapped in black bandages, blood seeping from their wounds. Dragon swallowed. It seems Negative One isn't in the mood to answer you, Gertrude said, smugness leaking out from behind her mock sorrow. Still, it's good that you've come. The negative numbers had made poor test dummies for Zeroth. You young things will serve much better. The speaker clicked off, and Dragon instinctually tensed. The thing that was giving him this bad feeling, it was still here, 
It was in the garden with them. That's supposed to be tensed, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, I fixed it. It revealed itself. From the darkness behind negative one, a massive hand reached out, large enough to hold the kneeling figure's head in one hand. With terrible strength, the hand squeezed, pulping the skull in its grip, bits of bone and brain leaking from between its fingers. It let go, and the corpse fell to the floor. Thud! Thud! With thunderous footsteps, the owner of that hand stepped out of the shadows. He was a monstrosity. Uh, popcorn, my throat hurts. He was at least eight feet tall, and even that was being modest. His body was engorged with muscle to a grotesque degree, but that wasn't what made him seem inhuman. No, what did that with the stitches? Just from looking at him, you could see what had brought him about. Pieces of many different people being bound together. Countless corpses combined into a single living human being. It was like something had walked out of a horror videograph. His skin, too, was a patchwork tapestry. Some dark, some pale, some grey, and some, especially the circles around his cloudy eyes, a vivid red. The only article of clothing he wore was a pair of black shorts. As he marched forward, his bare feet left cracks in the stone path beneath him. His very existence embodied brutal, unnatural strength. Rocky. Come on, Rocky. Um, I'm gonna make a timestamp. I think, like, 2625. Sorry, was that. <laughs> where was I? That's okay. She's sweet. I love Mom Honey. A thin um, line of drool ran time. from his mouth, dripping onto the ground below. Xerof. From the story Mila had told him, Gertrude Half had secretly been taking steps into the role of genetic engineering. Was this thing the result of that experiment? The speaker turned back on, one last time. Kill them, Xeroth. No, not Xeroth. Not my boy Xeroth. <laughs> he would never. Zanzanic walks so Xeroth could run. Um, give me my fun fact now. So, I don't know if you saw this, but I've, I've, I've outsourced <laughs> questions from the community. I saw you did that, which I thought was um, interesting. I liked it. So, Jade, I'm going to answer one of these questions every episode, because otherwise we'll run out of them if I just answer loads of them. <laughs> JTKC says, oh, the this is like looking at one piece with like, the reader's questions. <laughs> JTKC says, are the characters speaking English or some space future dialect? Do other languages exist? Uh, so yes, obviously I write in English because I can't, do not know space language, but I think this is a very, very, very advanced sort of fusion of all our languages very far in the future, so it would be unrecognisable to us today. Uh, the easiest other languages one, do exist. I, the, easiest way, the easiest way I would describe this, because I think you brought this up before, is have you ever read like a really old English book, like original exactly, Beowulf? Yeah. And it's like every tenth word you kind of recognize. Exactly. It'd be like that, but forward. It would be like slang we can't even comprehend yet. Exactly. That's how I like to think. I, I always wonder if people like 2,000 years in the future will like look at what we wrote now and be like, what the fuck is this? Or if it's just like, or if the internet will kind of make it easier to keep up with things as they go, mm. if that makes sense. Mm, I get what I mean. But yeah, that's right. There are different languages. We have not sort of encountered them because it would be very awkward to write. But um, maybe we will in the future. Yeah, it would be tricky to put. You'd have to make it... I guess you'd have to only be able to reveal what they're saying from POVs so mm, people yeah. understand the language. Or have, it would or be something other than most... going into the art rather than something like I can just sort of off the top of my head do. <laughs> the most cop-out way to do it and the most annoying and lazy way to write it would be to say the character spoke in X spoke and then yeah, that's a cop out. Like, he said, might as well just not do said, it. At that point. He said that there, blah, 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 blah. and then have the translator come in. Johnny okay. respects your warriors' will. You have to give us one more question. One more question, Jesus. As I part of you for that, you just decided this. So, yeah. Sobek says, "Does April space have the internet as we understand it? Does it stretch between planets, or just local networks?" The UAP and the I, supremacy I, of beef on April Square. 
I actually brought this up to you in Arc 3, and you told me that each planet has its own internet. Its own internet, and then there's a collective internet between those, which is a bit uh, more difficult to... Uh... Yeah, because it's slower, because it has yeah, to exactly. travel the light But there is no s- galaxy-wide social network. The UAP and Supremacy would not have beef on April Twitter, unfortunately. Yeah, because, because like, the way... Is like internet's traveling at the speed of light through packets, so to go to other planets would take like days, months, years just for single messages. So I like to imagine that, and I mean maybe they've come up with some like special technology to make it a little faster. Mail whatever, men are like, so much, so much more important. <laughs> I imagine that like you don't communicate on the internet outside of that command, and what you'd have for like emergency government communication is maybe there's like relays. And then, like, when they shoot off a message, it goes through those relays, and those relays, like, kind of send out pings and just give that data to everyone within their range, and it's and it's like a chain reaction through their territory, if that makes sense. That's how I imagined it. Nice. I, I, you're supposed to answer the question, not well, that's, me. That's true. I, that's the way it works now. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I only, I only knew that because I remembered asking about it in Arc 3 with Talden. Because you mentioned how, like, Jargon went into the network or something. Or someone went into the network, not Dragon. And I was like, they have their, every plant has their own internet, right? Yeah. I just answered it again. <laughs> but yeah, All that right. was um, 9.31 stitched. Alright. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.